Hello and welcome to our first video lesson on Chapter 21, Transcription and RNA. In this, uh, this lesson we want to look at the difference in structure of RNA as compared to DNA and also define what constitutes a gene. The processes of replication, transcription, and translation are all repetitive processes. We're building polymers of either nucleotides or amino acids by adding monomers in a repetitive fashion. Each has three major steps. In the process of initiation, the molecular machine binds to the template and associates with itself the first monomer needed to form the polymer. In the case of replication, that machine is DNA polymerase. Transcription involves the machine RNA polymerase. And as we'll see in the next chapter, the process of translation involve, involves the machine the ribosome. After we've initiated the synthesis of our polymer, we continue in the process of elongation, where we read the template and add the next monomer. This is the truly repetitive part of each of these processes. In replication, it involves synthesizing DNA. Transcription, we're making RNA. And in translation, we're forming protein. Eventually, we reach the end of the template and then begins the process of termination. The molecular machine is released as well as the completed product. Let's define these terms, replication, transcription, and translation, in order to gain a better grasp of the overall purpose of each of these processes. To replicate simply means to duplicate. We're making an exact copy of the DNA. To transcribe means to make a copy in a different form. So in cellular transcription, we're making a copy of the coding strand of DNA, as we'll see, in the form of RNA. Now it is a different form. It's RNA rather than DNA, and we'll look at those major differences in a moment. But it is the same language, the language of nucleic acid. To translate means to render in another language. The process of translation, therefore, involves converting the language of nucleic acid into the language of amino acids to form proteins. And we'll look at that process in the next chapter. Let's next look at the two major differences between RNA and DNA. The first and most important difference has to do with the nature of the sugar upon which we build those nucleotides. In DNA, we use the sugar deoxyribose. But in RNA, we use a ribose sugar, so our nucleotides are ribonucleotides. As highlighted by the red circle, the major difference is that 2' prime position carries a hydroxyl group rather than simply a hydrogen atom. So in other words, the major difference between RNA and DNA has to do with a single atom, an oxygen atom, at that 2' prime position but it has much to do with the nature of the structures that can form in RNA as compared to those of DNA. The position of that 2' OH of the ribose prevents the formation of class classic Watson-Crick B helices in the RNA because of steric hindrance. The 2' oxygen atom would come too close to three atoms of the adjoining phosphate and one atom in the next base, as highlighted in the figure to the right in yellow. So although RNA can form Watson-Crick base pairs of complementary sequences due to hydrogen bonding interactions, it cannot form a standard B-type helix. It forms other structures, as we'll see later. The second major difference between RNA and DNA has to do with the nature of the nitrogenous bases. The bases adenine and guanine, the purine bases, as well as the pyrimidine base cytosine, are identical in DNA as well as RNA. Of course, in DNA, these bases are attached to deoxyribose, whereas in RNA, they're attached to ribose. There is one base that is different, however. In DNA, we have the base thymine, pictured on the far lower right. And in RNA, we have the base uracil. As highlighted by the blue circles, at the five, number 5 carbon in the base, thymine is carrying a methyl group, whereas uracil is carrying simply a hydrogen atom. Let's next define what is a gene. 
we are, you're no doubt familiar with the fact that in the process of transcription we're going to generate messenger RNA or mRNA transcripts and in the process of translation that will be converted to a sequence of amino acids. But let's remember there are ribosomal RNA molecules, rRNA, and transfer RNA molecules, tRNA, and others, as we'll see in a moment, that are not translated into protein. In other words, they function solely at the level of the RNA. Next we want to notice that in most cases one message, one mRNA transcript, will produce one polypeptide. There are exceptions, however. In prokaryotes, many of their messages are polycystronic. That is, they carry multiple cistrons or genes. And even in eukaryotic systems, some mRNAs contain the code for two proteins in overlapping sequences. In other words, the difference is where we start. We can produce two different proteins. We also want to acknowledge the fact that there may be control elements in the DNA that are required for the process of transcription, but they do not manifest themselves. They are not transcribed into the form of RNA. This would include promoters and other regulatory regions, as we'll see in a later lesson. We also want to acknowledge that RNA transcripts undergo processing before they reach their final functional form. In eukaryotic systems, this involves the splicing of introns in a message. A typical gene consists of about eight exons, or protein coding segments, and we'll look at the process of splicing in a later lesson. But keep in mind, other RNA molecules are processed as well, and this includes rRNA as well as tRNA. So then we need to include in our definition for a gene that there are two types of genes. First of all, protein coding genes where the DNA is transcribed into RNA and then translated into protein and there are non-coding RNAs. In other words, the gene is transcribed into RNA and functions at the level of the RNA. It's never translated into protein. These are the so-called non-coding RNAs. As it turns out, about 80% of the human genome that undergoes transcription produces non-coding RNAs. In other words, if we were to express the entire genome, 80% of the RNA molecules are never translated. In this table from your book, we have examples of non-coding RNAs. It's not important you remember each of these. We'll consider some of these in turn, but simply to acknowledge the fact that many, many, in fact most of our genes are non-coding genes. In our next video lesson, we'll look at an overview of transcription and we'll also look at the structure of chromatin and how it's altered in order to prepare for transcription.